everybody. It's incredibly good to be here this afternoon. And before we get started, I feel like there's a couple of things that you should know about me. The first one is I am a terrible map reader. It doesn't matter if it's a paper map from my car or the newest navigation app on my phone. I am directionally challenged. Now, the second thing I want you to know about me is that I have a PhD in geography. <laughs> These two things don't really go together. And uh, after telling you my dirty secret, I'm, I'm worried that the University of Oregon is revoking that degree as we speak. But the simple fact that I am, have a hard time reading maps really drove me as a young researcher to try to figure out why is it that some people instinctively, just intuitively read maps and move through the environment, while other people like myself cannot find their way out of a paper bag? And ultimately, how do we design technology that meets the needs of a range of people with a range of abilities? Then I had an accident. The radiator in my car exploded boiling hot water in my face. I was thrown back over 10 feet and badly burned. The doctor said that it was a miracle that I had not been blinded. I just closed my eyes at the exact moment that the water hit me. And as I was recovering, I began to think to myself, what would it be like to be blind? How would I know what was in the environment? How would I do really simple things like cross the street, as you can see this woman poised at an intersection with a cane? And my life and work changed forever that night as I started to investigate how is it that blind and low vision people read maps and navigate, and more importantly, how do we design tools and technology to meet the needs of people with disabilities and meet the needs of people like me? Now, in the beginning, I was young and I was kind of ignorant, and I thought, well, blind people probably just aren't as good at reading maps as sighted people, right? Luckily, I was quickly rescued by some very good research that shows people who are blind or low vision, they do not lack spatial abilities. They are not fundamentally different spatial thinkers than people with vision. What they do lack is access to environmental representations. So in our world today, that means that your favorite navigation app on your smartphone that helps you find places in the city locates that hot new restaurant you've been wanting to try out is not fully accessible for somebody without vision. What we see is a fork in the road, like this road sign shows. It's a digital divide between those who do and those who do not have access to mainstream technology. Now, I want to be careful here. I am not suggesting that there aren't some very, very good apps out there specifically developed for blind and low vision travel. But what I am telling you is that mainstream technology, the ones that come standard on your phone, which are for free, I might add, are not fully accessible. These apps are made for a narrow group of people in our society. They are not universally designed to be accessible by people with and without disabilities. Regardless, one of these separate but equal uh, accessible GPS navigation apps helped one of my friends find a new coffee shop that we've been wanting to try out. I don't know if you've had this experience, but you look down at your phone and that little blue dot that's supposed to be you, yeah, it's like across the street or in the example behind me, it's in the ocean. <laughs> yeah, I'm a bad map reader, but I know I'm not in the ocean. The reason that I bring this up is because GPS technology is just not as accurate as we would like it to be. We see a breakdown in current modern technology, even the best accessible technology, when you go from the micro scale of navigating city blocks, where GPS does a pretty good job, to the micro scale of finding places, entrances, exits, even specific rooms and buildings where GPS often falls down and fails. Now, hopefully, at that point, I put my phone down, right? Phone isn't going to help me anymore. And I start to look around, and I start to look for signs. And I say, oh, yes, of course, right? There's Kobe's Coffee. That's where we wanted to go. And look at that. It's right next to the vegan cow. I have no idea what they serve there. <laughs> but what does a blind and low vision person do? How do they read signs? Well, at the Smith Kettlewell Eye Research Institute, where I did my research fellowship, they designed talking signs. So talking signs put a transmitter out in, in the environment that gives off an infrared signal. That infrared signal is then picked up by a handheld receiver. So when you point your handheld receiver in the direction that you're interested in, you hear, Kobe's coffee, Kobe's coffee. 
Ah, Kobe's Coffee. And Kobe's Coffee is right next to... Cow. The vegan cow. The vegan cow. So all of a sudden, what we see is accessible signage. What I really like about talking sign technology is that it provides directional information, right? In that last 100 feet, where we often see traditional GPS starting to fall down. But the bottom line is, nobody wants to carry around this receiver, right? Blind and low vision people, along with people with disabilities and people without disabilities, just want to use their smartphones. So increasingly, there's new beacon technology that does just that. It pushes um, environmental information straight to your smartphone using Bluetooth. Now, iBeacons was not originally developed for accessibility purposes, but the disability community is quite savvy, and we're good at co-opting. So here, you can see beacon technology being used in museums to provide information about art. It's also being used in the San Francisco airport to, to provide blind travelers with information about uh, things that are in a terminal, like, for instance, where you can charge your phone, because we all know that location-based services on our phones eat up the batteries. The drawback with beacon technology is that it requires infrastructure, right? And the bottom line is, somebody has to change those batteries. Beacons, they don't live in the cloud. And we can't actually attach a beacon to every single thing in the environment we might want to know about. The world is a complicated matrix of features. And when we talk about universal design, what you may want to know about might be different than what I want to know about. So you say, Megan, what is the next big thing? Tell us what the new technology is in environmental sensing that's going to revolutionize the accessibility world. And I'm going to suggest that it's 3D cameras on our phones. There are a number of companies that are now developing three-dimensional cameras that before long are going to come standard in all of our mobile devices. Um, one of these projects is called Google's Project Tango, and they have already produced a prototype where they can put out three-dimensional uh, maps of a person's surrounding. So all of a sudden, those really complicated environments that we couldn't map, we can. And we can map it into fine detail, providing accessibility of the world that we have never, ever seen before. Google states that its goal is to provide all mobile devices with human-scaled understanding of space and movement. That is revolutionary. But and you knew there was going to be a but. But for people with disabilities, for people with just a range of abilities, these products are only going to be as good as they are universally designed from the ground up. So often we see technology take off and soar and then sit back and watch as accessibility and usability gets added on at the end like somebody forgot. This always surprises me because, frankly, we all want our technology to be flexible, like being able to send a text message using the microphone instead of the keyboard. So voiceover or voice recognition is a great example of how we can provide accessibility to flat screens for people without vision, and we can provide good situational usability when you want to do something eyes free. So creating the next accessible navigation app means designing technology that is inclusive, that is accessible, that is usable by the broadest range of people. That means from the new mom who now has a baby stroller to my friends and colleagues who are blind and low vision and me, the bad map reader. So when we as a society, when we as a culture and as a community of consumers expect and buy devices and programs that are universally designed, that is when we are going to see ubiquitous consumer-grade technology that is meeting the needs of the almost one in five Americans currently that have a disability in America. That's almost 20% of us. That is when we are going to see industry opened up to the power of the $220 billion disability market. And like Steve Jobs with an iPhone, I promise you, the universal design will produce the next big thing you never knew you couldn't live without.